welcome, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome, welcome back, welcome back, 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 welcome back. Cue the music. In today's video, I'm gonna share with you some of the principles that I've used through my journey to Broadway. Welcome to Roar School. I'm working on a theme song. If you'd like to know more about Roar School, go ahead and click the link down below in the description. It'll take you to my website and you can get more information. So let's begin. Roar stands for resourceful, optimistic, authentic, and reliant. What the heck does that mean? Um, the like button and subscribe. I will be posting more videos like this as we go through the Roar method. I'll see you real soon. Hi everybody, it's Danielle Waters. Thank you for tuning in to the Creators Room, Reimagining Theater in a Pandemic. I'm Danielle Waters. Uh, I'm the Senior Manager of Arts Education Programming and Performances, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. The Creators Room is a series of, um, is an intimate conversation about the journeys of a creator's working behind the scenes in the arts. Most of all, the importance of protecting your artistry and providing you tangible resources you can use to jumpstart your, your career or reignite your careers. On tonight's panel, we have Cindy Winters. She has been performing and teaching all over the world. You might have seen her on NBC's live uh, Jesus Christ Superstar with EGOT recipient John Legend. She's been on Motown the Musical, Pimpin', and working it as the Shiler sister in Hamilton American Musical. She's put her heart and soul into one in her one woman play, Lena, A Moment with a Lady. Welcome, Cindy Winters. Hello. Hi, everybody. And then next up, we have one of our beloved NJPAC teaching artists and NJPAC alum, performer, writer, and all around superstar, Daryl Stewart. Most recently, Daryl has launched his own production company titled Daryl Stewart Productions and has written a compelling, compelling motivating, and, uh, motivating essay on Medium about self-producing. Daryl Stewart, please come to the virtual stage. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Thanks for having me. Speaking of motivating, Marcia Pendleton is a marketing spe specialist and founder of Walk Tall Girl Productions, a boutique marketing agency for on Broadway and off Broadway shows and theaters. Walk Tall Girl Productions has had a successful 20 year record as an audience diversity expert in the following in depth knowledge of black history and culture, expansive experience in communicating with different communities um, and much more. Also, Marcia has a radio show titled Backstage Stories on WBAI 99.0 FM. Marcia, welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here. And last but not least, we have Doreen Oliver, performer, producer, and storyteller. Doreen recently wrote a moving essay on Audible titled Grounded. The essay is a personal essay about autism, race, and the sacrifices mothers make to give their children a chance at a good life. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage, Doreen. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining. I'm so appreciative that you saw my vision of the creator's room. And I would love for you all to discuss um, how you've pivoted during this year. You know, it has been a pandemic. We've been shut down and Broadway has been shut down for over a year. Um, I'm anxious for our attendees to get to know you all. Uh, let's start off with when when it when the pandemic first happened, how did you pivot professionally and personally, and how did it affect you? Anyone can go. Okay, I I'll go first. Um, change can be extremely difficult, 
and March 12, uh, 2020 was devastating uh, because that's when everything shut down, Broadway, off-Broadway, and I saw uh, my business just leave. Um, and I did not know what I was going to do. So I did something that a lot of people did. I took to my bed. <laughs> and that's why I stayed for about a month. And then uh, something uh, shook me and said, you cannot continue to, to do this. I do a weekly uh, newsletter. On, on Mondays, and I felt that it was important for me to get it back out there, um, and that's what I did. I started with my weekly newsletter, picking up everything that I could about theater as it was transitioning uh, online, and uh, what that did was it served as it served as a reminder to clients, both uh, new and potential that and also uh, re returning that um, I had built this online community and they needed people to know what they were doing as they moved online. So that was the first pivot that I did in, in terms of getting through the pandemic. And it, thus far it has worked out uh, well for me. And that's great. Um, Cindy, I know that you primarily were working on like Broadway and you really, during this time, your YouTube got to, you know, excel a little bit. Can you tell us more about how you did that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so when pandem when the pandemic hit and, and Broadway was shut down, I was in a workshop with uh, working with Disney on Broadway to bring a new show to life um, about an African princess so um, when that didn't, when, when they said it was going to be closed for who knows, you know, a couple people thought a couple months, I knew that it would be at least four to six months before we would probably even remotely begin to start talking about coming back. Um, 13, 14, 13 months later, here we are. And um, when I, I heard a rumor that they were going to put, the city was going to put a perimeter around Manhattan. So I thought, oh, wait, what about my parents? So I got on a plane and moved, and flew directly to Florida um, to be with them. And I quarantined myself. And during that 14-day quarantine period, I did a lot of sleeping. Um, at that point, I had been running so much. You know, I think a lot of us were all suffering. We're just going through, like, a work, like, focus on work and like trying to make the nut and also being inspired and just getting almost getting to that place where like I'm just feeling like I'm getting somewhere and then bam everything was just kind of silenced so um I had a realization of my work has primarily been on stage live in a very limited capacity room um it doesn't reach past five to 1100 people or 1700 people right at one time which is still a lot and it doesn't leave a lot of time to do anything else like so if i wanted to film a television show i'd have to take a break from broadway or if i wanted to focus on a youtube channel i'd have to really dedicate time to that which i didn't really have prior to this moment that we're in so um I started going on live on Instagram every morning, riding my bike around my neighborhood. I knew that it was still cold in New York, and so I would just kind of bring sunshine, play music, and just have positive affirmations. And sometimes I'd have friends come on and talk with me in the morning. I called it the morning vibe. And I would get questions about well, what's it like to be on Broadway? Um, what are some of your pre-show rituals? Um, things like that. And so I, I started to think, hey, maybe I could start a YouTube channel. Um, my friend Todrick Hall said to me very, a few years ago, he said, Cindy, you should start a YouTube channel. And I thought, I think I'm funny. I think I'm pretty entertaining, but that's just a party of one. <laughs> um, but you know what? Let me see. 
Mm. And so I had my best friend lived in California, in Los Angeles, and she was wi willing to help me build this together. So, you know, I used the people around me to, I said, hey man, we're gonna only survive if we link arms and try to do this together. And I've really survived off throughout the entire pandemic on having a diverse portfolio of friends. Mm -hmm. You know, not just only having artist friends, having friends in the corporate space, friends in politics, friends in all over who value artists and what they contribute to the world or the spaces. You know, not everybody can sing and not everybody can dance, not everybody can write, not everybody can act. They, outside of our creative world, we're special and we're valuable. And so mm -hmm. I, I, had, I had made a promise to myself that moving forward in my life, I would, I'd like to collect as many diverse friends as possible. And through that, I uh, created my YouTube channel. We launched, I grew from 33 subscribers, probably me and fake email addresses and my best friend, <laughs> you know, and people who like love me um, to over a thousand subscribers. And that takes work, you know, it takes a lot of work. Um, and it, it's not as easy as you think it is. And trying to find content that people find valuable um, really can be tricky because it, it involves a two way street, right? Mm -hmm. They have to give you feedback. And a lot of times people are just on, on their journey watching something and they go, oh, cool. And then they kind of move on. I'd love artists on YouTube need feedback in order for us to continue to grow. So uh, on my channel, I talk about tips and tricks in the theater industry, the stuff you can use, not the stuff that they, that people think is useful that are like, you know, in universities or conservatories, right. which is great. Mm -hmm. It's all great. But my stuff is more functional. <laughs> I didn't go to a university. I didn't go to a conservatory. And so, but I'm still, you know, my credits are my credits and no one can take that away from me. And I've used my method my way. So I created the ROAR method, which means it's an acronym for resourceful, authentic, resourceful, optimistic, authentic, and reliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those uh, YouTube videos, as soon as I saw, I was like, oh my God, this is like exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to the creator's room and having resources and building your network. Um, Marcia, how have you um, used your resources during this time? And, and also Doreen and Daryl. I yeah. spoke oh, ahead, about, Marcia. okay, I spoke about my um, first pivot, um, which was um, continuing the um, promoting uh, things online. And then the second thing that happened for me is that I became a content creator as well online. I had lost touch with that side of myself uh, in terms of, of producing uh, programs and events that I've done throughout my career. If it, it goes from as simple as doing a post-show discussion uh, after a show or uh, doing an event that attracts thousands of people at the American Museum of Natural History. So, <laughs> I wasn't doing a whole lot of that. And what this gave me, this time gave me the opportunity to do was to get back in touch with that, the part of me that is a producer. And then that led to uh, Backstage Stories, the radio show. Mm -hmm. uh, it came out of left field. I was working with someone on WBAI uh, maybe about a year earlier, uh, she invited me back to the show to talk about what I was going through uh, and what the industry was going through um, during the early months of the pandemic. And the general manager of the station heard me on the air. He knew he was going to have an opening and they reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to have your own show? Mm -hmm. And I was like, 
uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I do. And uh, I agree with uh, Cindy, it takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of work, but it's very fulfilling. It's extraordinarily fulfilling. And it allows me to introduce some of my favorite people to an audience and have these, these conversations, which is really beyond my wildest dreams at, at, at this point in time. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, but. definitely. Because <laughs> you guys, you're both Cindy and Marcy, you're making my point that it's important to dig into your network and have a diverse you know, portfolio of friends, like Cindy was saying. And I know Doreen wanted to say a little bit about how um, she's been using her network as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I first will mention my original question. And also just for those who don't know about me, thank you, Danielle, for mentioning um, the new release. But but in terms of my bio, like I have, um, I was a film producer um, for Lee Daniels Entertainment. I um, and I write, uh, I'm a writer, I've been published in a, a number of different places. Um, and I also wrote, produced and performed my own one, one woman show. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I'm a performer, I'm a producer, I'm a writer. And also since my one woman show, I've been doing a lot of speaking engagements. So in October of 19, October, 2019, so just a few months before the pandemic, I spoke to like, I was a keynote for 3,000 people and then everything shut down and all I wanted to do similar to Marcia is just you know I just wanted to hug my family close and stay in my house like you know it was yeah it was just a very difficult time and I think for me even though I had a very background um, it was really all about focusing internally first what is it that I'm feeling, especially this is important as an artist, like what is it that I'm feeling? What is it that I need? What is it that I need to do? And two things happened. One, I published um, a piece uh, in May in a, uh, that was one of my more personal pieces. I wrote a piece and I published it in a literary journal. It was one of my deeply moving pieces that really resonated um, with a lot of people. But in June, with all the, um, after George Floyd was murdered and there was a lot of rest and reckoning happened, or at least discussions of reckoning, um, I wrote a piece that was published in the New York Times about um, uh, what happened when my child with autism went to Target and they called the police on him because he was uh, he hugged an employee. And so, and that was what was burning inside me. And I was, and I was very afraid of the repercussions because I don't, even though I write a lot about my children and my family, it was just, I, it was a very high profile piece and I was very concerned, but it was what my, I had to write it. I couldn't live with myself if I didn't write this and get it published. And from there, and, and this is why I talk about doing what's inside of you. From there, so many things came out of that. Um, one of which ultimately um, my literary agent, we eventually, we ultimately connected with Audible and that's how this piece that came out yesterday was released. But also, I also happened to have an MBA and a CEO of a organization <laughs> contacted have, me. Yeah. And, what did you say? I said you happen to have, you said it like it's a- Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so a CEO of, of uh, organization, I mean, I got like hundreds and hundreds of emails and like thousands and thousands of hits to my website. And a CEO of an organization contacted me and asked me to do some consulting work for them related to what I was talking about in my piece. And for that, I, I appreciate it because it was fascinating work, but I also appreciate it because as an artist, it, it also made me realize, I, I met a whole, bunch of people from that and created another network from that but it was also it also made me and I know we're going to talk about this understand the discrepancy of being paid as an artist versus being paid as a, someone with an MBA mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it, it and and um yeah so it was it's one of the and the great thing about that is that 
you know, from doing that consultant work, it's been able to fuel a lot of my creative projects. Um, it's just been able to allow me to pay for things that, that I'm working on in different projects. So I, I say all that to say, this long story short is that you really have to be true. This is not, I feel like the pandemic is, has been a very scary time. Quarantine has been a very scary period, but finding, I think these, these critical life moments are really about finding what's inside of you. What do you need to say? What do you need to do? What are the things that you've always been afraid of that you are ready to do now or that you have a moment or you have some silence, you know, so that you can really listen to yourself and listen to that voice and allow whatever it is to come out. Um, and so that's why I mentioned that because it, it can, if you do that, there's so many things that will come from that. Exactly. And Daryl, how did you tap into that um, creative space after, you know, at what point in the pandemic did you feel like, yes, this is the time I need to be doing this project? Well, uh, much like, like what was mentioned prior to um, my speaking, in March, um, when the pandemic first hit, to put a number on it, um, I was working on, I was freelancing three different directing, producing projects. And I watched about $9,550 evaporate into cancellations. So um, that was a hard week. Uh, that was a hard month. And on top of that, my mom was in St. Barnabas Hospital getting a kidney transplant. So not only was I kind of going through this uh, wave of cancellations, but I also, someone who was a part of my support system was unavailable because I wasn't allowed to go to the hospital and she wasn't, she obviously wasn't able to, to come out. So it was a, it was a really, it was a, a traumatic month, but I feel like um, I'm reminded by like Maya Angelou that every cloud has a silver lining. So I'm like, okay, I, I, I see the cloud. The cloud is, there is no theater. There is no Disney musicals in schools. There is no Mercer. There is no freelancing. There is no cabaret. There is none of that. Where is the silver lining? Um, and, 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 and much like Doreen mentioned, after I was able to quiet myself, um, I was able to identify other areas, other skills, other things that I could bring to the space, to the world. Um, in October of 2019, I partnered with Nork Arts, which is like the city arts organization to devise um, a piece called Hear Her Roar, uh, which was done through my production arm, Dow Stewart Productions. I didn't, uh, I would, the focus was on the piece, not the company, but I remembered that I had started that. I had started the paperwork. I had started the process of filing an LLC. I had started uh, building this brand. And so I had lunch with a mentor and she said to me, why don't you, you know, why don't you pull out the Daryl Stewart Productions shingle and, and start to really work it? Mm -hmm. And, um, a light bulb went off. And I, the first thing that I did was I went on Instagram and I created a Daryl Stewart Productions Instagram. And then from there, I began to strategize, how can I get the eyes that I want to see the content that I want to create? Mm -hmm. Again, how can I get the eyes that I want to see to see the content that I want to create, which may or may not be a play or a musical. It may be a podcast. It may be a short film. It may be um, a devised theater piece. It may be a dance piece. It may not be art at all. It may be speaking engagements and consulting. And so I called on my network like Cindy um, and got all the best and brightest minds who were all at home to get on Zoom with me and help me build out Daryl Stewart Productions, which I one day hope 
to kind of be referenced as the Black Walt Disney Company. So that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> I love that because you were saying um, um, when we met before that it was a particular person that reached out to you and, and it really changed like your outlook of um, what it, what you wanted to go for with your um, production label or company. Um, at what point now do you feel like confident or what resources were you um, are you currently using to make sure that your company could get out there a little bit more? Well, I think mentorship is very important and artists don't necessarily, as Doreen mentioned, think of themselves as entities. But the truth of the matter is if I'm the one with all the ideas, I am the entity, right? And so I think the first thing you have to do is be willing to accept yourself as a brand or as an entity or as a corporation or however you wanna um, name yourself. And then it's about identifying uh, the, a lane, right? What are you going to be known for? Um, uh, what are you, what is your skill set area of expertise? Um, and then I think it's about building upon that. So I have uh, friends who are attorneys, you know, who I consult with about not only legal things, but in what ways might an attorney utilize a production company? Oh, commercials. Okay, great. So I can start to write commercials and I, you can contract me to direct this commercial, right? I can use my phone to create it. I don't need a camera necessarily. I have a great iPhone, I can use that. And so again, I think it's just about taking the limits off of the mind and imagination and tapping into, tapping into your intention from a different angle. Cindy, I see you nodding. How do you feel about that? Ditto. I agree. How do I get the eyes that I want to see the stuff that I'm creating? Mm -hmm. There and are 11 billion people in the world or 8 billion people in the world. And now we have access to a global market. So mm -hmm. with this pandemic, Broadway has shut down, but it's really, it's really did something really special that our producers don't love and made it a free market mm -hmm. in a way. And right. We can be in Bali if we wanted to. We <laughs> yeah, can give uh, access yeah. to the arts, performing arts, Broadway, style, musicals, plays across the world. Mm -hmm. And I've been in an orphanage in Chile, or I've been across the pond in Japan, all through the comfort of my home, and yet offering the experience and the get the whatever I know to from wherever I am to wherever they are and we're all gonna we're in an information age and so we're here just to learn from one another and sort of take ownership and um my, uh, entrepreneurship sort of like a not a brick and mortar but we're like our own little shop where we can create, you can stop by my shop and get whatever you need right? Or that I sell. Exactly. And you just gotta make sure that what you're, what you're selling is something that people are gonna find valuable. And then you're actually selling. And you're actually. Are, like you're getting income and money. And you're actually making money. Yeah, I, I think that's important for us all to talk about and think about and for people listening to talk about and think about. Um, and one of the things that I want to mention that Cindy was talking about that she made me think of is that, you know, and I'd be curious to what the other panelists think about this is that, you know, when you're adapting your art to a Zoom screen, right, like what translates, like what trans, how you figure that out, um, because it's great that we can be everywhere, but that doesn't mean like, everything fits into this medium. And so for me, I did my first, I did my first um, major speaking engagement, again, via Zoom um, last week. And, you know, part of, in my speaking engagements, I do, I, I might do one or two scenes from a show. And I decided very, there's one scene that is 
great, great, great. But I was like, I don't think it'll work for Zoom. So I did not do that. But I did this other scene that's a little bit more quiet, a little bit more still, and it worked just as well. So I, I so I think it's worth talking about like um, how, and, and, and also I feel like that, that scene is always boggles me, but that scene works always on stage, like always like, and, and it's very memorable and it always, and it's works on Zoom. So it's interesting to figure out like what works in um, the, whatever medium that you've translated, like when you have to translate it, whether it's for a podcast or YouTube or whatever, I'm curious to what everyone else. It's been really exciting to go on that journey and test things out. Like the greatest thing of that, what that has happened is that we're all on the even playing field. Like we saw people on CNN, NBC, Revolt TV, messing it up, <laughs> trying to figure it out. I'm sure they had an intern like getting them all on StreamYard or OBS or whatever it was. Like, how do you, uh, how do you get Diddy out the picture? <laughs> how you mute Diddy's mic? <laughs> Turn his camera off. You know, he don't need to be, we run it on time still. So right. the, you know, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work, especially when you translate from live on stage to on camera, that is where you, you have to have that intimacy, right? As if you were talking to a friend, mm -hmm. the subject changes, the focus changes. And so you can't be yelling, you can't be out here uh, projecting to the back row. I was doing these performances, sl these small performances with a with an organization called Broadway Plus, and they um, set up meet and greets, for families, friends, birthday parties. You know, they were they kind of became like an, a little agent for these Broadway performers who were free, you know, out of work. And I set myself up from an er, from early on to have my my sound and my video on a particular level where it was um, palatable for you know the audience. Um, some folks didn't have they had a Bluetooth speaker, so they're performing like they would perform for the Broadway audience and losing the audience and losing the performance because they're singing away. You know they're projecting away and talking to the subject off camera where the, the subject is here and choosing that song or choosing that monologue, it became uncomfortable for them because it was new. And when I was asked to sing a song from Hamilton, I had to switch my subject and who I was talking to. And so the camera became my friend more so than this, you know, sort of grand uh, presentational kind of performance. Um, so yeah, it's been a fun journey figuring that out um, and learning the do's and don'ts, what works, what kind of doesn't work as well. And, I, and, and do you have any tips on what worked for you or what didn't work or how long did the trial and error ha have to um, happen for you to realize like, okay, this is working? Oh, I'm still trialing and erring. I'm still doing a lot of errors. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's only been a year. Right. And um, I do this regularly, but it's it's all a test. We're all on an even playing field. Even the people who have, have the big network dollars are still trying to figure it out. And, but I think it's li literally, like I said a little bit earlier, treating the audience as the subject, if you're, a if you're an actor, if you're a performer, right? If you're a poet, you are talking no longer to the back row, the person in the back row by the exit sign. You're not talking to a friend in an intimate setting. So your tone is going to be different. Your voice will sound different. Your intention will sound different. It's like acting for the camera, only it's you, right? Right. right. And it's more, and, it, and it's you're limited. Right. Mm -hmm. So as you're performing, you're you're being yourself and you have to kind of bring it. You have to bring the audience closer to you in that way. And I just want to add to that for folks who direct and choreograph and who produce. It's also about reimagining the audience itself. 
right? That the audience is not just physical bodies that come into the theater um, or into a actual theater, right? That an audience can, uh, uh, they can assemble themselves in a park and they can assemble themselves outdoors. They can assemble themselves uh, online. Uh, they can assemble themselves on Instagram Live or on Zoom like we're doing right now. So I think um, now having that information, I'm hopeful that theater makers will get creative and I'm, and I'm sure they are uh, going to get creative about how we use that word audience. What does that mean and what constitutes as a theater audience. We should have no issues with accessibility now, right? Because mm -hmm. we have Zoom and we have Instagram and Facebook and all of these platforms. So I'm excited to see how this pandemic and how using digital will move the conversation forward around those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, Daryl, I really appreciate just what you just said about audience, who is audience? How do you consider them? Because prior to the pandemic, audience, the relationship between an institution and an audience member was mostly transactional. It was not transformative. And that's what the digital space gives us the opportunity to have a different kind of relationship and intimacy that is so important that is lost when you are in that communal space known as the theater. I got bored with um, readings very quickly. I was just like, I don't wanna go to another, I don't wanna see another reading. I don't wanna see another talking head. I'm done, I'm done. Uh, but in terms of the conversations, the, the, the panel discussions, that was a different kind of thing. It was wonderful for me to be able to bring together Michael Eric Dyson with Dominique Morisot because they were both Detroiters. And the person that I had um, moderating the conversation was also from Detroit. They, of course, there was a Detroit theme to, to um, what we were doing, but that was much more exciting to me than yet another reading of a play that I wasn't particularly interested in <laughs> anyway. And also with being on the radio and um, soon to be a podcast as well, knowing what I can do with my voice, how people are hearing me. Because people say, oh, I didn't know you had that kind of voice. And I said, but I did. <laughs> and being in that medium gave me the opportunity to, to use that, to be able to, to draw people in, to be conversational. So when I have my guests on, they say, oh, I'm, I'm so comfortable. And that's on purpose. And part of that is who I am as an individual, but also the use of my voice as well to make sure that people feel comfortable. So audience, I, I've been in audience development for a long time. And this moment has allowed me to think of audience in exactly those ways that, that you were that you were talking about, Daryl. It's very, very insightful of you to, to share that with us. Absolutely. And Marcia, you have a very warm and soothing voice. So warm, <laughs> like honey. Thank you. With a little cognac in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't know if how many of the our attendees saw the Super Bowl with the weekend and his halftime mm -hmm. show. And he sort of, uh, he sort of created his, it was his attempt to create like an immersive situation, like a virtual reality sort of idea. And when he brought you into this maze and sort of like did everything full on. And I think that that was an attempt to transform how the audience experiences live performance. Um, 
you know, it was a vibe. It happened. But I think this is, it, it was a great attempt at creating another lens, like experiencing it through a different lens rather than it's so blown out having a film and a film a cinematic aspect to it where you just sort of focus in you can choose what the audience sees and how the audience is experiencing your thing right and it's like everything that you all have been saying is like the power of pivoting so you used to being on the stage and now you're on podcasts and and things like that um i know with podcasting and also YouTube. Let's talk more about ownership and owning your space. Um, I know Doreen, you've worked on different platforms and, and things like that. Can you tell us more about how you found your space and how you're owning it? Um, yeah, I feel like I I feel like I don't have just one space. And I and to me <laughs> That's what I own. Like I, I have a space in terms of all the stories I tell, you know, I say, you know, um, you know, illuminate the heartbreak and the beauty of life, right? I think whatever it says in the first line of my bio, that's what my space is, right? So it, you know, I I, I usually I speak about race and autism, race, racism, autism. And just the unpredictability of life. Like, that's my thing. Like, and sometimes the unpredictable is hard. Sometimes it's less hard, but you go through, right? So that's my space, right? But to me, I don't have a space in terms of a medium. Like, I've worked in film and theater. I've worked as a producer, producing independent films, but I've also been on a stage singing and acting. Um, and I'm a writer. Like, that helps me um, sort of, that is really the thread that connects me through everything. And so I feel like in pivoting, um, for me, pivoting is all about in what medium now do I tell my story? Cause I have to, like, that's the desire for me. Cause you know, that unpredictability of life is what I grapple with personally. And so for me, for me to write about that and share that and let other people allow or help other people not feel so long. Cause sometimes my writing is dark. I mean, Hopefully at the end, you'll be a little bit, you'll be inspired, but you know, it, it's very real and it's very raw. And so to me, it's like, how can I help other people not feel alone? How can I, how can I um, create bonds, whether I am physically in person in a theater or whether someone's reading my stuff online in the root or whether I am, which that piece actually was about theater. Um, and then, or if if I'm speaking to them or performing in front of a screen. So that to me is what's critical and that's my space. And it's just for me adapting into various mediums. And I've had to, and I've had to, and I mentioned this once before to you guys, but like, for me, I've had to change medium when my life, personal life had to change or did create a change. So, you know, I was working in film and I was going to Cannes, France for the film festival or Sundance or Toronto for the film festival. And then I had a baby and I had to readjust. And I thought I was gonna start my own film production company. So I was gonna use that time at home to start that. But then after two years, I realized my son had autism. And that's when I translated to telling my story through writing. And, and, and after a while, when I thought I was dying because all I was doing was staying home with my child. <laughs> um, and I felt like there was so much more for me to do and say, I ended up writing this show and, um, and, that, and, and performing it and producing it. And so, so to me, a pandemic is just yet another life moment, like critical life moment where I've had to pivot. And for me, it's, I think one of the great things about Audible is that I can now perform and I can now still tell my story through a new medium. Um, and it's just, you know, through audio. And it, it was really um, lovely. I got my two shots and I was able to go into the actual studio. And um, it was great to be able to express you know, not just on words, but with my body, to use my body, my voice in particular again. And so I think that has always been the ability to, to uh, transfer my story into a different medium has always been literally a lifesaver for me. Um, and uh, 
I think, I feel like we all, sometimes we feel like we only have one talent. Um, and I think that it's always great to try to stretch, you know, think about what you want to do and try to figure out how you can do it. If you can't do it this way, maybe you can do it this way. And that's, and to me, I always, always, always take classes. Like I do not have an MFA in writing or performance. I don't have any of that. Um, but I, I went to the new school and I took classes at night and I went to NYU and took classes at night. And now it's great because, and I've done workshops, like I've gone to Tin House. And now it's what's great being able to create my network with artists also is that I've gotten to a point in my career where this summer, like I go to writer's residency and artist residency. So now this summer I'll be going to Yado, which will be great and creating and dreaming of other things. And I've gone to VCCA and other places. So I think it's just, you know, I, I always just want to learn. And I think, always knowing and I'm still taking classes because I'm, I'm writing in a different genre now so like always being hungry to learn and know that you don't know everything and that there's so much more to learn I think is the key to um creating a flexibility in your thinking and in your talent so that when times are rough you can go to the next, you can you can go to the next thing And speaking of which, like Cindy, I know with Lena, a moment with the lady that came up from some, you know, someone from another performing art center contacting you and asking you, how can that piece be translated into school? So can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. So uh, after my, my run with the Lion King, I was, I, after I played Nala and then the national tour of the Lion King. I came back to New York and was fun employed. <laughs> Didn't have a gig and was auditioning, but there was a there was a wait period because it wasn't I had to get a new agent and sort of like reintroduce myself to the Broadway space because my first job out of college was the Lion King. And so it took me on the road for three years. And any friends that I had made was during a short period uh, when I made my Broadway debut in 2012 as Nala in the Lion King on Broadway. And I made mm -hmm. a lot of friends um, during that time. And one of those friends, his name is Chester Gregory and he's an incredible performer. And he has this amazing show about Jackie Wilson. And I was like, Chester, you're great. Everyone loves you. And I can do exactly what you do. So I'm very, very um, audacious. And <laughs> he's like, oh, yeah. And thank God, Chester is such a uh, light in the spirit and so encouraging. He was like, oh, well, who, what show do you think you can do? And I rattled off a few names. And I was just kind of shooting at the hip. And he was like, um, OK. And then I paused and he said, oh, what happened? What's on your mind? I said, well, mm, this is a tough subject because it's, it's bigger than, you know, my little self. And he's like, what? This is going to be good. I said, uh, Lena Horn. It would be cool to tell the story about Lena Horn. And he was like, do Lena Horn. Um, I'm going to get up the phone now because I'm on vocal rest and hung the phone up on me. So <laughs> I was like, thank you, Chester. So I did my research. I went to the Library of, Con uh, of um, Performing Arts at Juilliard and 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 the google and looked everything and look as much as i could up about this woman and realized the more i researched about her the more i loved her the more i related to her and how many other women my age are going through similar things that she had gone through and so uh in 2014 i put a indiegogo fundraiser crowdfunding campaign i had booked motown the musical right at that same time so i was performing with motown the musical yes marcia that's where we met <laughs> and um i was on my way and motown the musical was really great at promoting their artists outside of the show because they were originally from the music space. And so like any anything that like Marvin Gaye or Brian Terrell Clark who played Marvin Gaye was doing outside, Motown's PR would promote it. And so they said, Cindy, you have, you have something going on, let us help you. And so they did. And through that medium, I got an, um, an opportunity to perform on Good Day New York, uh, do a snippet from the show. And they called me and they said, do you have B-roll from the show? And I was like, I absolutely do not. I have a flyer that my friend Mario made me. And I have an audition tape 
from after midnight. And I sent it to them. And they were like, we love it. And I said, you love it. I'm obsessed. So I went in and I performed. And then that night when I went to the, the show, the whole cutting room was, it was, we did it at the cutting room in Manhattan. The whole space was standing room sausage. People were standing shoulder to shoulder, up down the stairs, standing in the, where the seats are. And I thought, wow, not only was I able to make my goal of the money that I wanted to raise to fund this thing, the attendance was incredible. And we were filmed it that night. And since then, we have been developing this project. When I say me, it's like me and my three personalities, my ego and my stress and my little voice that says, hell no, you can't do that. And then the one that goes, go ahead, girl, you can do it. We and all my friends who believe in this project push forward to make it happen. We were so close. We were going to Ojai's Playwrights Festival and to, in 2020, and the shutdown happened. The project's dead now. I lost my writer, she's gone. I lost, you know, my director's like, oh, listen, I'm not doing anything. So I'm like, this, this project's dead. So I had a friend who, well, not even a friend, someone that I worked with at Disney Theatrical in the education department. I was a co-host for this. I was one of the co-narrators of this project for Disney musicals in schools and Disney on Broadway as um, teaching young people an introduction to theater through the lens of the Lion King. And through that, he was working for Broward Center of Performing Arts down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And he said to me, Cindy, do you have Lena Horne filmed? And I said, I do. The very first iteration. He's like, can you send me an edit? I called my boy Marvin. I was like, hey, Marvin, what you doing? Can you cut me a... Can you cut me a, an edit for, of that footage? He's like, Cindy, I still have it from eight years ago. I said, you the man. So he cut me a full length uh, version of the show. We, uh, my friend Timothy Maines over at Broward Center helped me put together a study guide and we have brought it to performing arts centers and uh, educational institutions to allow young people to know who Miss Lena Horne was, what were the things that she went through in her life? What kind of stances she took as a black artist in America and what impact she made in, the, in our American culture and entertainment. And I'm so proud to be portraying Miss Horn, but yet also carrying on the legacy of black history in uh, our space. And also flipping it too, because you know she was a pop star. She yeah. was like our Beyonce. Exactly. And so being able to, to sort of bring her into a generation of like kids who have no idea who she was and who and she's contributed so much. Right. And that, so it was those, you know, the beauty of having those friendships that made you like reimagine that piece in a different Absolutely. way. Absolutely. It was dead. The project was dead that the files were lost. I didn't know where anything was. And I so happened to just called my friend Marvin who cut my trailer and he said, I still have all that footage. Of course, I'll do it. Uh, that's and he didn't charge me much. And I'm so grateful because I probably would not have had the money to, and I also had to get music rights. And mm -hmm. that's the expensive thing, friends. Yes. I'm still paying on that. <laughs> and that's a great segue for next Friday. We have another creator's room and it's going to be more about music publishing and licensing and um, right. So do you have any pointers about um, how you uh, how you gain those licensing rights? And is it like a long, tedious thing or tell everyone? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you all <laughs> something. OK, have an idea of what you want. Don't be concrete about like don't have your heart set on the songs you want because they may not be available for you to use because they may be too expensive mm -hmm. or the publisher is not, they're, they're already optioned to somebody else right. in the theatrical sense. It's very different from when you like, you wanna cover a song, you just paid a fee and that's mm -hmm. it. When you go into theater, it's like a completely different beast and they confound a lot of, they give a lot of red tape if you want to connect a song with a storyline. 
If you just want to sing the song, pay the fee, sing the song, get your life. If you want to add it to a storyline, then you have to pay grand rights. It's a whole different thing. So for, for education, because it's an educational thing, the educational service I provide, they have a specific rate and it's lower than the commercial rate. Okay. And what I did was favored nations. These are all songs that are vintage, you know, Cole Porter, George Gershwin, um, Yip Harburg, all these older songwriters who, you know, I'm not trying to find Bodak Yellow by Cardi B. Like I'm, I'm not going to be covering that. So the rate would probably be much less. Right. So, mm -hmm. Think about the idea of what your of your show and sort of the songs and the feel and the energy you want to portray and how that's that song pushes the story forward. But you could yeah, have to you have to have a couple of options mm -hmm. if those songs aren't available. Okay. Mm -hmm. From there, you I worked with a music licensing consultant, um, Darnitha Lincoln Mumbai. And she, I actually found her because I was a part of another Broadway project and it was a Broadway project that mapped all the different people who are involved in Broadway shows. Mm -hmm. Any one from actors to ushers, to music license, to attorneys, to producers, designers, all those things. And the map led me to her and she was a black woman. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I'm gonna call her. Cause not only will she know, she'll know how to get around something because I'm sure doors have been slammed in her face. Right. So I'm going to go to her and she has been able to consult with consult me in moving the needle forward and making it um, a streamlined process for gaining uh, getting clearances for these songs. So I would say this has been a learning process and it's been so fulfilling once you nail the rights you're like mm, I did that yeah, right. and you can just move on to the next thing but it's 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 a process and you want to kind of stay open and it's and I'm learning so much that's amazing uh let's go on to the Q&A we have a couple of questions it looks like this one is for you Cindy how do I start a YouTube channel oh that's easy anybody can start a YouTube channel go on YouTube <laughs> create an account and then you get an option to start your own channel. You just got to read the, read the, all the little buttons around there. Mm -hmm. And it'll say like, create channel or upload video. And when you upload your video, voila, you got a channel. <laughs> right. You can put whatever you want on that channel. You can make, you can have a channel about making sandwiches. <laughs> if I like, what, I like the sandwiches one. that you make, I'm going to subscribe to your channel. <laughs> Somebody has a making your sandwich channel. I'm sure. I'm sure there's thousands. <laughs> yes, and there's thousands of subscribers. Mm -hmm. Or even people to watch you eat something. It's a lane for everything. <laughs> I like to snack on now ladies. Okay, well, I'm gonna subscribe to that. <laughs> exactly. Um, next question, do you have any advice about acquiring a literary agent? Um, sure. Um, it depends on what you uh, want to write or if you're writing. Okay, so I don't know who knows what. So I'm just going to start a little bit backwards. So if you wanted to write books, um, then you can have a literary agent um, uh, for, for it, you, it depends on what genre you, you're in. So if you're in fiction versus nonfiction, I write a lot of nonfiction memoir. Um, so, but, so I say that to say that some agents only represent one or the other, although many, many, many represent both, um, maybe most, but it's a different process. Usually if you're in writing a book of fiction, you have to write the whole book and then you send it to an agent and you write a little blurb and you say, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, this is who I am. You make it very short and you send not necessarily the whole book. You have to look at whatever the agent says. Maybe they want the first 10 pages. Maybe they don't want anything at all. Maybe they just want the query letter, which is where you do a synopsis and say who you are and maybe what other writing credits you have. Um, with nonfiction, 
you also send a query letter and they just, they'll say, yeah, I want to see your proposal, but you have a proposal. Um, and that's where you don't finish the whole book, but it's like a business plan. Um, and it has some sample chapters of what you've write, written. Um, and it, you have to tell who you are. It's very much more about your platform. Do you, where are you, how many followers do you have? Where are you in the world? All that, you know, have you ever done anything else that, you know, that people will listen to you? Like for me, I, if I had a show that was, you know, that was here and, and did really, really well. So, you know, that was good also. Um, but if you're a playwright, like if you're writing for a play, then there's separate agents for that. If you're writing for theater, if you're writing for, um, like a lot of playwrights, for those of you who don't know, have transit, well, before the pandemic, they've been doing this, but like even more in the pandemic, a lot of playwrights are sought after to be like right for television, mm -hmm. sought after. There's like this pipeline between playwrights and writing for television. And so a lot of agencies have this motion pick, you know, they have like different, like, um, like I remember in film, like we always use motion picture li literary agents because they had people, they had screenwriters, et cetera. So I believe it's the same for television, but there's a certain section, different type of agent that represents playwrights. There's also agents that represent, you know, if you're working um, uh, for, if you want to get into television. So for that, I think you have to, I have not yet done that, but like for that, you have to also send a query, but ultimately you have to have you have to have a play um, and you have to know who the agents are. You have to know who the good, you have to do your research to know who does what and who's good at what. And uh, yeah, so that's that's the best way to go about that. Yeah. I tried to be 702. <laughs> that's great because it is very important to research um, all of the literary agents. I did the same thing with music publishing. It's like, I had to learn who did, you know, who was publishing for what. So it's very um, important to do that. Um, the next question that I have uh, probably is for you, Doreen, again. Um, how do you balance being known for different things as a multi-hyphenate artist? And how do you market yourself for each one of these things? Okay, wait, read the first part of that first first part of that question. Sure, how do you balance being known for different things as a multi-hyphenate artist? Okay, so I think it's very important to know when you're approaching certain people, you can't be like, I'm X, I'm Y, I'm Z, and I'm C, and I'm D, and I'm E. Like, whoever that person is, you want to be just, it, whoever that person has, the, like, what they have the resources for, you should just, you should just focus on that thing. Like, so, um, you know, for example, I literally just, on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn, so I have an MBA. Um, and I, I never paid attention to my LinkedIn. I had it just because it's there. I mean, I've had it, but like, I've never really paid attention to it. But LinkedIn is the social media that all the corporate people go to, right? So I do mention that I have a show, but I just redid it yesterday. It's all about speaking engagements because you're really most likely going to be hired um, to, I, to speak, you know? So I mean, that's what they, that's what they're mostly interested in. And it's great that you have a performance background, but so I just, I really just reorganized that so that it focused on my speaking engagements. I have CEOs of companies who have given blurbs about my um, talks and I've, I've just highlighted that. Um, and so it's also, it's like, you know, it depends you, you so you have to be the person um, if you're focusing on your play, it, then you have to focus on your play. Um, and also I have learned, and this is also very important. I was doing a deal. Um, there was a producer who was going to, I was really focused on taking my show on the road, doing a national tour. And I was very close to closing a deal with this producer. But I, because I have a business background, I was really negotiating on my behalf. And I, the deal did not go through. And I realized I cannot be both artist and producer at the same time. I cannot, it does not work for me. It, it, and it, it doesn't work for anybody. I mean, that's really why people have. So I ended up you know, hiring an attorney to do all my, so I never, I don't negotiate anything on my behalf because depending on how negotiations go, not only could it, the, the, the people can go sour on the deal, but they can also go sour on you as the artist as a result. I mean, people are really, yeah. People feel all the feelings, no matter 
how much business it is. So that is one thing I learned. Like I cannot be artist and producer at the same time. So that's how I've had, those are the things that I've learned. Um, so yeah, focus on whatever project you're focusing on that. Don't come in the room saying I'm this and this and this. No one to hear that. They'll cause also they, they'll think you're not focused on whatever they is, whatever it is that they want from you. So I think it's just to focus on whatever um, medium or thing that you're working in at the time. Right. Um, Daryl, uh, Cindy, do you have any anything to add to that? Yeah, um, I, I love Billy Porter. I think he is one of the most talented, multifaceted artists of our time. Um, and in the piece that I wrote for Medium, I talk about Billy Porter. Most people know Billy Porter now as Pray Tell in the, you know, the award-winning FX series Pose. But prior to Pose, Billy had directed, he had taught at universities, he had written his own play, which premiered off Broadway at Premier Stages. I mean, a man of many, many talents. I don't think that anyone will look at Billy Porter uh, on television and say, um, you know, that he is not these other things, right? I think like Doreen said so perfectly, it's just about being where you are, right? Like if you're the playwright in that moment, in that space, at that in that season, you have to be that. I will also say, um, myself, you know, I have a formula that works well for me, 30, 30, 30, 30% 30 performing, 30% directing and uh, producing, 30% teaching. So you have to find your 10% having fun and not being on Zoom. So you have to find your formula. You have to find where you can, because, you know, you want to succeed, right? And so you have to figure out what is your formula? How much of this and that do you need to make a full pie? And that will depend on the person in their skill set. Ditto on all those accounts. Um, and then also thinking about as an artist, we talked about this and in, 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 I think in a previous talk about financial literacy and having multiple streams of income. And yes, focus on your art, but a lot of times art can't put food in your mouth directly. So understanding how you value yourself, like Doreen said, sometimes you are, you everything, you know, when you first start off for, for a project, the person who's advocating for you the most is yourself. And at some point you have to sort of pull away, but still have a producer's mind, but yet knowing that you have someone negotiating on your behalf because your value is, is much, uh, is more recognized, I guess. If you are a little bit one step away from the table, but you you have to have a conscious mind of how you want to, how you value yourself and your product um, and understanding how in your multi-hyphenate-ism and your multi-hyphenate-ness, how you are going to generate right from those gifts or from those talents um and so taking time to think about that but that's a whole nother talk that we can talk about at another time but always keeping that in mind and i think you know marcia being a, being someone who understands audiences how would you relate into what you do now i'm asking questions who am i the moderator how do you relate in this space as a multi, because you work with so many different projects? Yeah, um, it's audience development, marketing, group sales. Those are all three different things. I have also done press, which is not necessarily my favorite thing to do. Um, I realized where my strengths are and where I am not so strong. Uh, but realizing what I bring to the table and what the client needs. Uh, some cl times the client does not need the relationship building that comes from audience development. Uh, they don't have time for that. 
They just want the butts in the seats and we need to do it right now. So that's part of a marketing function and a lot of times a group sales function. The, and that's important to be able to do because that creates different strengths of income for me as well. And then the pivot uh, for during the pandemic to a uh, content creator, uh, digital content creator, and also a uh, broadcast has been a real journey for me as well. And I use what I know from the marketing, audience development, group sales, press, um, and I bring that into the picture with me understanding um, what people like to hear, what people like to spend their time doing. Um, New York is, we all know that, that New York is a big place and they have a whole bunch of things that they could do um, uh, pre-pandemic, but there are a whole lot of places that people can go online and you have to figure out how to break through that noise as well. Um, so my thing is be clear, you know, be really and truly clear about who you are, what you can do, what you bring uh, to the table, what makes you unique and what separates you from the competition. Uh, be very clear about all of those things. And the other thing that I like to say is stick with your vision, but also be flexible. Mm -hmm. Be flexible because if you're not, you miss those blessings, you miss those opportunities that say, here, I'm right here. Right. You know, like, hello. <laughs> and, be, and you're so busy. No, no, no. But, um, um, be flexible as well. I love that. I do have a couple of more questions. Are there any platforms that connect songwriters and artists to playwrights who are looking for original songs? And would that be an easier hurdle for playwrights to get over instead of getting commercial releases cleared? Um, I think you can answer that, Danielle, but Mm -hmm. uh, you still have to, if, if you're connected with a songwriter and you're, you're a playwright, you're connected with a songwriter, it can be easier because you have a relationship with them, but you still have to have a negotiation and a contract with yeah. them and still want to offer them something that is valuable, mm -hmm. you know, because when the thing hits, it hits and everybody going to blow up and you don't want anybody mad at you when everybody's coming to collect the money. Exactly. Okay. So we want to be fair. Mm -hmm. And the music is just as important as the, as the writing, as the book. So yes, because you'll get a collection of songs from one artist rather than having to dole out different fees, right? But you still have to negotiate and you still have to offer them something fair and it is as a collaboration. Am I wrong? Spot Underline fair. Underline fair underlying fair right. because writers and makers cannot live off of your empty praise. We cannot turn the lights on because you think we're funny or talented or you, you know, want to go to our page and suck up our energy but not offer anything in return. So again, as we travel through this pandemic and hopefully post pandemic, as it relates to all forms of creatives, artists, and makers, underline fair. I love that. And the last question that I have is how can I market my play right, my play slash script for off Broadway? I think the question is, are you sure you wanna go? Off Broadway, I, I I encourage all creatives, particularly writers, to take advantage of the great deal of programs. Um, now there are a lot of uh, programs out, so I would say organizations have programs.
Thank you, Froze. Doreen, do you have? Uh, yeah, I was going to say. Um, so, so that once upon a time, there was this great. There were all these great. We lost you, Daryl. I think you're back now, but we lost you. So we didn't hear anything that you said. I don't know if you want to go back. We heard- I'll Pro type it in the chat. I'll type it in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> um, but there, um, once about a time, there's this incredible, incredible, there are a lot of theater, there were theater festivals, right? When we had theater in person. And I think that's a wonderful and extraordinary way to get your play staged inexpensively, and where and that's where a lot of like agents, et cetera, would come and see it. So I, um, that's what I did with um, my show. It started at the um, French Festival, French NYC. So the New York International French Festival, I think is what it's called. And it did really, really well, like record breaking numbers. And it was great. Um, and then, and I got great press from it. And then I took it to, but I don't know what's happening with French right now. They had taken a hiatus, they had reformulated, then they came back and not, and then now it's the pandemic. So if it comes back or when it comes back, look at, look out for it um, because it's been in, around for over 20, at this point, like 24 years. Um, and it's very well established. There's also the United Solo um, Festival where we had won the audience award. We, I took that there the following year. Um, definitely check it out. It's, you know, some, some people really enjoy it. Some people, uh, yeah, so you should check it out and see if that's good. Um, but it's always, you know, look for uh, those types of festivals when it, things come back. Look for, um, find producers who do off-Broadway. And then you, you look, you can find anybody's email. Look, you can find people's home addresses. Don't go to their homes though, do not go to their homes. But you can, you, well, all I'm saying is that the internet is vast. So you can figure out how to connect with producers who have produced off Broadway. It would be great to first get an agent. And it's also first, like there's a lot of um, um, theater companies. And I, I was going to say a few, but quite honestly, some are, 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 are no longer there and they're closing some of the smaller, wonderful theaters. Um, but yeah, you can um, look for the, look at theaters, look at their programs. Um, look for them there. They, they, they are looking and interested. Oh, I can tell you right now. I was on the board of this theater program. Sorry. Page 73 um, productions is excellent. Is extraordinary. All they do is develop playwrights. Okay. They're amazing. And they will take you and nurture you and feed you on their bosom. And like, really, they're excellent. Um, so page 73 productions is a great way. And they have smart, smart people. Um, I went to school with a co-founder, two of the co-founders. They're great. Yes. New York Theater Workshop is amazing. But uh, one of the things that I love about page 73 is that they focus solely on playwrights. Focus. I mean, it's all about nurturing playwrights and they have so many programs. So definitely check that out. And there are a couple that I want to add. Um, Parody Productions, Playwrights Realm are also two great things. And Don't Sleep on the National Black Theater or the Billy Holiday Theater or the New Federal Theater uh, or even the Black Spectrum Theater. Don't sleep on any of those theaters. And finally, uh, there's an organization I'm on the board of directors for. It's called the Black Theater Network. Uh, we also have, in addition to playwrights, directors, uh, actors, designers, we also have a large number of academicians, uh, people who work in uh, uh, college and university theater programs. That's a good place to get your work done as well. Uh, a college and university. So uh, go to blacktheaternetwork.org. We have a conference coming up. Uh, attend our virtual conference and connect with, with um, people uh, in the field, uh, both in school and, and out of school professionals as, as well. Also, I would mention there's writers conferences. So WONA, Voices of Our Nation's um, Arts Foundation, um, they actually just this year, maybe they did it last year too, but they've always been very focused on lit, um, you know, nonfiction and fiction and poetry. But now this year they started, they are having um, stage and screen workshop where you can, you know, you have to apply and be accepted. Um, and that's all, that's specifically for people of color. 
Um, and then um, this Suani, I always pronounce it wrong, but they've been around forever and they also focus on playwrights also. So it's a, you can go for 10 days, I think they are, um, but you have to apply. Um, all the de those deadlines have passed for this year, but there's always next year. Yes, and also I know Audible is looking for playwrights at this moment too. So I just put that link in there. Um, and you all have provided so many gems and resources. And, uh, you know, we're a little past seven. So I'm excited that, you know, all of our attendees got to know a little bit about you all and some great resources and see how like fantastic you all are at your craft and many spaces. Um, and I just want to say thank you. And if you have any last comments, please go ahead and take it away. All I will just say is just go back to what I said in the first question. Just listen to that little voice inside you. Listen, 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 especially when there's a quiet of the pandemic. I know there's starting, there's more and more noise now, but listen, listen to that voice inside you because you need to answer it and however best you can, because otherwise it'll make you sad if you don't. And, but more importantly, it, it, that voice inside you is a gift to so many people that you don't even realize. Um, so you have to, you know, you have to give that. Yes. I just wanted to add, um, uh, first of all, thank you in JPAC. Yay in JPAC, thank you for the invitation. Um, and thank you to all the panelists. Um, I want to add, you may not be everyone's cup of tea and you should brew anyway because someone out there needs what you have. You may not be everyone's cup of tea. Everyone may not buy a ticket. Everyone may not understand or get it. Do it anyway because you will find success on your own terms and it will be glorious. Yes. I will say that the pie is big enough for anyone who wants a slice. Someone told me this when I was 18, just graduating high school. The pie is big enough for anyone who wants a slice. I added this addendum and said, you just have to determine, you have to determine how hungry you want, how hungry you are and how big of a slice you want. Mm -hmm. And being flexible with that, you know, sometimes you get a slice of that pie. Sometimes somebody gives you a slice of pie. Sometimes you have to go get another slice of pie. Sometimes you, it's not pie, it's cake. Right. You know, and believe in yourself, make friends, mm -hmm. be nice to people, be fair. Um, and if you'd like to connect with me on YouTube, feel free to subscribe to my channel, Cindy Winters TV. Your comments and feedback are super appreciative for growth and experience and more experimenting and finding out what you guys like on top of answering questions like this. You know, I've been so inspired by the guests here tonight and thank you so much NJ Pack, for having me just, just a little slice of my pie that I'm offering tonight. And I just wanna say thank you NJ Pack, for having us. And if anyone is interested, please tune in to WBAI 99.5 FM or streaming at WBAI.org for backstage stories. I'm on Thursdays at nine o'clock. I'd love to have you uh, join us. Yes, thank you all and all of the attendees if you registered. Oh, go ahead, Doreen. I just want to say my mother is listening and watching. Oh, so she hey, to mom. I, I write so much about my mother and she prints it and she loves it at the same time. But I, I just want to thank you. And my the thing with Audible, my piece Grounded is actually so much about her. So right. awesome. Yes. And again, thank you all, you know, panelists. This, um, the creatives room is a passion project of mine. I came up with it in my head and was like, well, I need all these great people, these great minds to come together and really provide resources for people that are always like, wow, when they get on, they're like, oh, I wish someone told me this when I was, you know, 
you know, struggling or wanting to get this project out. So um, I think this, you know, for this being the first The Creators Room, I thank you so much. And all of the attendees will get these resources. I will send a follow-up email with all of those uh, those great uh, resources that you all gave, those theaters, those workshops, um, uh, Doreen's uh, essay, Marcia's uh, radio station, Cindy's YouTube and Daryl's Medium article and all that stuff. Will <laughs> You all get that in an email. So thank you again and have a great Friday. Have a good weekend. Happy Friday, everyone. Take care. Yes, thank you.